This video is looking at Waterfall by Laurie Edmond um, and hopefully you've got a copy of the poem so we can annotate along together and you can make your own notes. Bear in mind that this analysis will be sort of step one in any preparation for any exam work you're doing. So the way I'd look at it is you do your first annotation and you end up with a big load of ideas on your page. Then your next stage is to consolidate those ideas into something more structured that you can revise from to write about this poem in an exam, if that's why you're looking at it. So don't expect that, you know, one annotating through and then you're done for revision. There's a kind of subsidiary step where you need to kind of really come up with your take on the poem. So you know that, OK, if I'm writing about this poem, what points, what arguments am I definitely going to put forward? How am I going to support those? But if we're looking at the poem itself, so just putting a clean copy on the screen so you can pause the video and read this through if you're not familiar with the poem or that you can just make sure that you've got um, the right uh, punctuation and everything on, on your copy. So there's page one and page two. Right. Looking at the annotations already there, I'm going to work through this. So first of all, so you can understand my handwriting and, and just to flesh out the ideas a little more. Um, I'm going to annotate now in blue so you can see the difference between what I'm doing and what I've previously done. So if we look at the title, first of all, um, I would always start when you when you come across a poem by really thinking about the connotations and the expectations that the title establishes. So here we know um, waterfalls, we've got that idea of the natural beauty of them, but also what's going to be critical for this poem is the kind of one way nature of a waterfall. You know, now rivers are often used as a symbol in literature for progression or lifetime or journeys or so, because there's that saying that you never stand in the same river twice because the water is always constantly rushing past you and the waterfall gives an even more powerful symbol of that because not only do you have this sense of one way flow and the idea that it's always changing but there is a kind of sense of inevitability about a waterfall that the flow of the water is heading in one direction which is going to take it over this edge so you know literally thinking about a waterfall you've got all of those ideas that lead us metaphorically into some of the images of this poem. So if we look first of all at the first sestet, so a sestet, if I put that up there, is a six line stanza. And I don't know why that's not allowing me to put the T on it. And there we go, back again. Um, so our first sestet, we establish very early on that we've got a first person speaker so we know that it's going to be a dramatic monologue that idea of one person speaking about their feelings ideas and the I evokes this feeling of intimacy and personal experience now we don't know whether or not Edmund is writing autobiographically um, the nature of her poetry is such that a lot of her poetry was drawn from her own experience so you'd be relatively safe assuming that the speaker and um, Edmund do share kind of that, that voice. But, you know, in, in good practice wise, let's talk about the speaker. Um, so we have this first person speaker sharing a personal experience. And the first thing that's said is this kind of surprising assertion, which establishes a tone of kind of wise acceptance for the poem. So I do not ask for youth which, you know, if you think of humanity and what we tend to want, you know, to be young forever, that is is setting out the speaker's kind of idea and, and the main premise of her observations, that she knows time isn't going to go backwards, just like she knows the waterfall is only moving in one direction. So I do not ask for youth, nor for delay in the rising of time's irreversible river that takes the jewelled arc of the waterfall in which I glimpse minute by glinting minute all that I have and all that I am, always losing as sunlight lights each drop fast, fast falling. Now I've read all of that because you'll notice straight away we get all of this on Jean okay? And it's got that kind of sense of flow and change and, and drive and inevitability to it. You know, we've we've got enjambment in every line apart from this, 
and then we've got the um, final line is also end stopped. So looking at why that might be, well, minute by glinting minute, we've got this pause for reflection. OK, and I'm going to come on to that, um, this little term in a moment. But we've also got here this end stop um, at the end of the sestet just to kind of round off each stanza. And that's something that happens throughout the poem. Each sestet is, is kind of end stopped it with, with a full stop. So that sense of completion and finality. So if we look at what, what she's doing and, and how she's doing it, you know, we've, we've got this metaphor of time's irreversible river. Okay, Time is, is personified as having this river that cannot go backwards. And we're aware that, you know, the duality of water, I was looking up here, comes into play. You know, it's life-giving, but it's also, I suppose, um, in the sense of a waterfall or a river, um, inevitably and, and undefiably going one way. Right? So you've got the kind of duality of it there. Um, there is also the rising of the river, which again, you know, goes against that life-giving idea that it's going to subsume them. It's going to maybe, you know, drown them, take them away, sweep them away, ultimately. And we have this uh, consonance here, the rising irreversible river, um, just kind of increasing the sense of the flow there into the jewelled arc of the waterfall. And that um, the idea of jeweled, take all of those connotations in terms of the um, value, the precious nature of it, the kind of awe-inspiring beauty of it. Look at the idea of the arc, the shape of it. You know, if you get an arc, you, go, you, you kind of go up and then down. So this idea that, you know, she's, she has and they have as a couple had their prime. You know, they, they've been kind of on the way up, they've peaked and then now they're coming back down again as they get older and older. But, you know, that that is kind of being echoed by this symbol of the waterfall. So she says, you know, in the jeweled arc of the waterfall, she glimpses minute by glinting minute all that I have and all that I am always losing. So look at the, the gl sounds. You've got that kind of um, fleeting idea um, created by the, the, the consonants of the gl, gl. Um, you've got glimpse, you know, connotations of glimpse being that really fleeting, quick glance. That idea that you it's not a studied look at something. It's a it's a momentary kind of sight of it and then it's gone. Right. Just like kind of, I guess, life, just like the waterfall, just like the experiences she's describing. And you get then this diacope. OK, diacope is where you get words repeated and you get other words in the middle um, or this type of diacope is. Um, and the diacope is on minute and minute here. If you can't remember that and want to say repetition, it's absolutely fine. Right. It's what you're doing when you're talking about the effect of the word choices rather than you know necessarily thinking, OK, I've got this fancy word. So the diacope or the repetition here allows you to focus on each moment. So minute by minute. And that's where, you know, I mentioned before that end stop, that comma, that's where that comes in, that you're held at the end of that line in that moment of reflection. Right? But the word that's that's kind of in the middle is glinting. And again, that's got the sense of something that you, isn't quite tangible, that, that is going to be transient, that's going to be fleeting. So although she's trying to concentrate on this moment by moment, each focus, she's aware that those moments are, are, are slipping away. And this relationship and the relationship with time and the changes that the two are having on each other is all that I have and all that I am. So this is kind of coming to, I guess, define her, coming to have a, a major point in her identity because there's always losing as sunlight lights. And again, you've got that consonant sort of alliteration on the la la la. And if you know, if you're looking at the um, euphony here, like the, the idea of the sound effects, if you like, there's, you know, the, the minute by minute, the kind of um, distinct contemplation of that. There's the kind of transient nature of the gl sound. There's the loose nature of the l sound as, as the, is kind of falling or disappearing. 
And almost the kind of urgency of the fast, fast falling. You've got both the sense of speed and um, I suppose delicacy from the f sound. Okay, fast, fast falling again. We've got the kind of repetition there. Okay, um, it's all one sentence. So that's so you get the idea of the pace behind it. Second sesta, we change focus slightly. And again, we've got this, this line parallels. Okay, so we've got that syntactical parallel. Um, syntax is to do with the word order. Um, syntactical parallel to the opening line. So she said, I don't ask for youth, I don't dream. Right. And so if if you want, you can kind of connect these two lines in terms of the acceptance of wisdom of older age. You know, she knows that um, she's getting older and she's reflecting on the impact and the influences of that and, and knows that it's pointless um, wishing to be younger or dreaming that the, the intensity of the love that she and her partner once had can be revisited. So I do not dream, you know, that I guess the certainty of that, that plosive D, you know, I do not dream that you, young again, might come to me darkly in love's green darkness. So just pausing there. We know that we've got this address. So the speaker is talking directly to her um, lover, to her partner. But there's also, as ever, in poems like this, there's those layers of direct address because we're reading it. So we are also the you. So you know that gives an idea of it being a kind of universal experience. You know, you might not be of this age, but at some point you will be and you'll be sharing these these feelings potentially. So you then we get that cesura in there for that pause to contemplate um, the person being spoken to. Young again might come to me darkly in love's green darkness. Now, she's saying, you know, I don't dream that it's going to be as it was. Um, and we've got this idea of polyliptaton. OK, again, that's one of those words that if you can remember it, great. If you can't remember it, you can pick out the idea that we've got dark and darkness. And that's all polyliptaton is. It's where you take the same root and you use it in two different word forms. So here we've got the adverb and a, and a noun. OK, and maybe that polyliptaton is, is looking at the kind of change, the development, the, you know, fluidity, I guess, of, of time. But she says, you know, I don't dream that you'll come to me darkly in love's green darkness. Take the idea of, you know, the natural connotations and the innocence, um, the vitality associated with green where the dust and dust is interesting in terms of the i guess ashes to ashes dust to dust um it's less um solid maybe this is again an, an image of you know things of things have passed now we've got the dust of the bracken spices the air moss crushed gives out an astringent sweetness and water holds our reflections motionless as if forever so you know she's basically saying here that i'm you know i don't I don't dream that it's going to be as it was, as passionate and as sensual and as intense. Um, it's impossible. You know, she's she's saying this, there's this idea that, you know, the water hold our reflections motionless as if forever. She knows it's impossible because it's negated by the first line. I don't dream this can happen. But she's still evoking this natural world where you've got the beauty and the sensual imagery, you know, to do with the senses and to do with, I guess, physical enjoyment and, and potential sexuality. You know, you've got the astringent sweetness of the, the sibilance behind that. So, you know, she really is remembering what what their relationship used to be about when they were younger. And then we get the next sestet. And, and bear in mind as well, we've got all of the points about enjambment and everything in there that I said for the first um, sestet. So we then, in um, contrast to the opening lines of the first two standards, we have it is enough now. OK, so I do not, I do not, it is enough. Right. So this is a position of current or present acceptance. And we've left the kind of um, waterfall for a moment. We've left the metaphorical woodland. We are now very much in the domestic room. So she's present day thinking about her life now. So it's enough to come into a room and find the kindness we have for each other, calling it love in eyes that are shrewd but trustful still. 
So she says, you know, it's now enough just to just to see the care um, and the relationship that has built up over the years. We've got this pronoun here, we. OK, it's no longer I and you. They are very much together, that kind of progression into a we over time. We share this um, and we call it love. OK, so the cesura, uh, note the plural of cesura there. These two dashes here allow her to redefine love in her current age. So it's no longer all about green darkness and astringent sweetness. It's about the value of coming into a room and seeing somebody who absolutely cares for you. And you've got that shared background. And she says, you know, she can find the kindness in eyes and those that, um, I suppose, the intensely personal nature of looking into somebody's eyes, windows to the soul and all that. And his eyes are shrewd. So that that's kind of cautiously wise. If you make a shrewd decision, you make a really well judged decision. OK, that you've, you've kind of taken this calculated, yeah, I'm going to do that feeling about it. So shrewd, but trustful still. So despite, you know, the wisdom, there's not a cynicism. There's not a kind of pessimism when it comes to her. Right. Face chastened by years of careful judgment. If you're chastened, you're kind of slightly rebuked or told off or made, um, I suppose, slightly more put in your place a little bit. So the experience um, of life, I guess, has has is borne out on his face, but his eyes hold all those feelings. And this is a kind of very restrained set of images. You know, it's careful judgment, shrewd eyes, kindness. There's none of that kind of sensual passion of the second sestet. This is what love has matured into. And, you know, you've got that, that um, semicolon there, the cesura, explaining that actually they sit in the afternoons in mild conversation. The idea of without nostalgia is also interesting. They are still living for now. Nostalgia is when you're thinking back to a time that has gone before and you're thinking kind of fondly, oh well, you know, that those were the days when. They're not living in the past. They are actually living now. They're not spending their time just thinking what they were. They are enjoying or they're, they're kind of appreciating each other in that moment which is which is important. You know, this isn't a poem where you're meant to feel sorry for the speaker because she's aged and maybe she's nearing the end of her life. It's a celebration of kind of the, the natural cycle of things. And then we have the final stanza, which looks to the future, OK? Um, or a kind of constant action that, that's, that's keeping going. So, but when you leave me and... I would say that is, you know, here literal, you know, she's talking about walking into a room and seeing her partner and having this kind of um, all these feelings of kind of, OK, this is what we've got. And then he gets up and goes. So in the domestic setting of the poem, but when you leave me is, you know, when you get up and walk out in, in the way she's about to describe. But there is going to be, you know, a, an unavoidable metaphorical leaving that they're going to do. You know, there is going to be that separation by death at some point. So we've got that idea of we've had, you know, the, the stanza dealing with the present. We're now looking um, with, a, with a kind of allusion to the future. And jauntiness is a kind of slight energetic kind of cheery energy in your, your step or so. So if you are jaunty, it's, it's a little bit happy, a little bit bouncy. But the jauntiness is sinewed by resolution more than strength. And if you think that sinews are those, um, you know, if you, I suppose, kind of start flexing your fingers and look at your wrist, you can see all those little strings moving around under the skin, um, tendons and sinews and things. It, it's part of your musculature. Um, don't, if you're a biologist, don't go and correct me on that. I'm, I'm kind of winging it slightly. But sinews, are, you know, you, sometimes you can see the sinews in somebody's neck standing out if they're um, uh, kind of uh, animated about something. And she's saying, you know, your jauntiness is sinewed by resolution more than strength. So this this kind of um, cheeriness or any energy he's got in his step is actually kind of being controlled or the strings are being pulled or it's being kind of um, used by his decision. You know, the resolution, if you resolve to do something, you decide to do it. 
right? So what's powering him is his decision to keep going rather than the strength he has to keep going. OK, so, you know, he's he's getting up and keeping on on going despite fading strength, but because psychologically or mentally he's still kind of wanting to do these things. And it, it just struck me here that, that, you know, there's that mental resolution versus physical strength, but also the way that the line is kind of set out. It's resolution more than strength. You know, it's, it's resolution beyond his strength, if you want, on that second kind of reading of it. Um, but one way or another, you know, psychologically or, or intellectually, they are, you know, almost more than they were um, as she watches him get up and leave with this kind of, you know, not quite artificial energy, but this kind of energy beyond what he should be able to do. And then we have the urgency here by this Sejura from the dash. And suddenly then I love you with a quick intensity. And the quick, you've got that kind of Q and the K sounds, that consonance and the line break there, really emphasising the kind of speed. You've got the monosyllables. I love you with a quick intensity. Right. So the monosyllabic kind of it's it's the truth. It's simple. It's pure. Yeah? And this intensity is different from the intensity in the dark, dark, uh, green darkness or darkly darkness that we we're talking about. But it takes her back to that water, you know, the water where they were going to be motionless forever, but that couldn't work out. And the waterfall that they are now that they recognise, you know, their lives are. And it's a return to all of the connotations at the poem's beginning to say, however luminous and grand, however filled with light and contrast there the light now with the darkness of their youth and, and kind of physical relationship, potentially, you know, the, the waterfall is light and grand, but it falls fast. So, you know, doing the same um, trick as before with that f -f -f, the kind of um ephemeral sense of it this moving quickly the transients um it falls fast and only once to the dark pool below and so you know we can we can maybe take the dark pool in, in terms of the inevitable end of their lives but it seems to be that she is motivated to enjoy what's happening now and to enjoy the natural progression of things rather than scared or resistant or fighting you know, this this waterfall is is this jeweled arc is a journey she's on. And that's fine, you know, because that's the way that things are. Most um, exams, sadly, to, you know, go back to the exam thing, most exams will definitely want you to cover form and structure. So if you're looking at your notes for this, make sure that you're happy with the things about enjambment and end stop. OK, we know that this is free verse, so it's got that kind of freedom, that liberality, that, um, you know, kind of I suppose she's been released from maybe the um, constraints or the conventions or the expectations of her youth. You know, she's settled into her own way of things or their own way of things. It doesn't um, it doesn't have a formal rhyme scheme. There's much more repetition. You know, there's no there's no rhyme. She's she's going for this kind of repetition. And there's an awful lot of alliteration and consonants and sibilance in there as well, which is giving it that flow and that pace and the feeling of kind of water and, and progression. So I'd make sure that somewhere you've got reference to these. It's um, four sestets, so four times six line stanzas. Uh, I have seen it suggested in crit in various places that that might mirror the seasons. Um, not entirely sure I'm convinced by that. But I'll leave that up to you um, for your ideas, whether or not you want to you want to argue that. Um, but hopefully that that allows you to have some degree of thought about the poem. Don't forget what I said at the beginning. You now need to go and kind of best best thing is kind of do some planning in terms of what you'd write about it, how you'd bring those things together, because you really you would benefit more rather than just working through line by line chronologically as, as we've really done go back and group things go back and kind of look at you know that that um repetition of the falls fast connect them together look at the light and darkness connect them together look at the use of enjambment throughout the poem connect it together look at the kind of syntactic parallelism um that's where the the kind of good eight nine marks are for, for gcse and and you know, obviously A star at A level or, or, you know, the sevens at IB. If you're kind of actually spotting the patterns and getting something bigger from those patterns, 
Okay, good luck.